tennis, a game in which the brain has to perform thousands of calculations per second to tell the body what to do when that ball crosses the net. But nowadays, the brain is not enough as tennis players and coaches are turning to computers to discover the secret of peak performance. Will a computer help you play a better tennis game? We'll find out next as we take a look at computers and sports on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom. <laughs> what a team. Well... We just got beat in a game of ping pong by a robot named Dragutin. <laughs> now you may think this is funny, but there are 3,000 of these robots in use right now training tournament level ping pong players, and that's only the tip of the iceberg in the use of robots and computers in sports. Now, Gary, the number, cr number crunching computer and the finesse and skill of an athlete seem total opposites. How do we use a computer in sports? Well, in this particular case, I'm going to go out and kick this little computer's <laughs> plug out because it's beating me. <laughs> but in general, it's just another vertical market, another place to sell computer systems. Uh, analyzing statistics, uh, trends, just uh, strategies in general, and also designing the equipment that we're using. Okay, we're going to have a lot of fun on this show. We're going to meet Steve Boros, the former manager of the Oakland A's, and find out why he had a computer in the dugout. We'll see how computers are used in football, track, and tennis. Now, computers are not only being used to play sports, they're being used to cover sports. We have a report. Hovering above stadiums and playing fields like a giant hummingbird, a new computer-controlled camera called Skycam is transforming the art of televised sports. It can glide and dive, shoot straight up in the air, and hover silently within inches from the ground. Supported on four thin cables strung across the field, the camera sits in a dumbbell-shaped cradle, equipped with gyroscopic stabilizers and radio-controlled electronics. The operator uses joysticks, much like those of a video game, to direct the camera's position almost anywhere over the playing field, and at speeds of up to 27 miles per hour. Skycam is a real-life exercise in geometry, giving the director precise and instant control of what used to be the most difficult of shooting environments. And because the positions are computer-defined, camera moves can be choreographed in advance, stored in the memory, and replayed later, the camera always returning to its mark like a good actor. While the camera's talents are not limited to sports, it is the field, court, or rink that makes the best use of its remote capabilities. A rectangular space is easily broken up in XY coordinates for positioning the camera. It becomes a vast 3D computer game with a range of a thousand square feet across and several hundred feet high. But unlike the typically flat image of video games, this one promises an almost infinite variation of depth and angle, from the smallest detail on the ground to the most extravagant panoramas. Joining us now is Billy Hicks. Billy's with Quantel, and Quantel makes a computer sports system called SportsPack. And next to Billy is Steve Burrows, former manager of the Oakland A's and currently in charge of minor league instruction for the San Diego Padres. Gary? Steve, I understand that in the past you've gathered statistics about games to help you, your strategies and so forth, done this manually, and then you've gone on and automated some of these uh, processes. What do you do? How do you use these numbers, and what do you do? Well, initially, uh, with the A's, what we try to do is keep track of the matchups, our hitters versus the opposing pitchers and vice versa. Uh, the classic example I use is uh, Situation Detroit, when I was thinking about uh, pushing Dwayne Murphy down the lineup. He's our team captain and hitting fourth and struggling. And I noticed, uh, according to the matchups, that he was something like uh, 8 for 16 against Dan Petrie, the Tiger pitcher. 
And rather than take him out of the fourth spot, I left him in the fourth spot. And in the seventh inning, he hit a grand slam home run, which basically won the ball game for us. So it's that kind of information that can help a manager make intelligent decisions. Mm -hmm. Now, have you, have you uh, uh, written some programs yourself or worked with some people now to, to automate a lot of these processes? Well, now that I'm going on with San Diego, I'm going to uh, encourage the Padres to uh, use the computer to keep information basically on scouring reports of our minor league players and minor league prospects that we'll see with other ball clubs. Uh, on the big league level, I can see a big league manager not only keeping track of matchups of hitters versus pitchers, but where in the strike zone a hitter is liable to hit a home run or make an out, and where in the field he's liable to hit a ball so that you can station your defensive players uh, a little more efficiently. Now, did you use this computer during an actual game? Would you go to look for information as to uh, what pinch hitter to pick, for example, what reliever to bring in? I used to look at the matchups before the game. And then where there was a lot of uh, information that was valid, I'd keep it on note cards that I had in my back pocket along with my lineup card. Actually, you can't use the computer and have a monitor in the dugout. Uh, That's illegal? Well, what they're afraid of is that you're stealing the signs uh, from the catcher and, and getting an idea of what pitch is coming. So that's mm -hmm. why baseball does not allow a TV monitor in the dugout. Now, what does management and ownership think about your, your use of computers you know, by managers and coaches? They're a little bit resistant. Uh, the A's management is a little more progressive, and uh, there are some young owners in baseball who are turning to the computer, uh, Turner, Steinbrenner, uh, the White Sox. But there are a lot of people in baseball who are very conservative and very resistant to any new idea like the computer. Mm -hmm. Well, did you get into situations, Steve, where your kind of gut instinct says, do it this way, and you pull it up on the computer and it says do it that way and what do you do then? I always go with my instinct. Uh, <laughs> most of all a big league manager has to be a master psychologist and sometimes you have to take the computer data and throw it out the window because what you're going to do if you utilize that information is bad psychology and you may destroy the confidence of the player. Mm -hmm. Billy, now let's turn to your sports back system and you have something that can be used in football, is that right? Yes. How, how would a, a football coach use sports back? Football coach will really use it in, in two to three different ways. Uh, the most interesting way is what we call scouting reports, tendency reporting, game analysis, both on yourselves, on your opponents. Uh, what it really breaks down to, you want to know what that coach is going to do. If it's third down, two to go, he's between the 40-yard line and the 50-yard line. You want to know what the tendencies are. Is he going to run to the right, run to the left? Does he normally throw a pass? Uh, they're breaking down film from previous games on these opponents, entering that information in the computer and trying to get a handle on it. Can, what he just may be doing. Can, that, can the computer system actually be used during the game? No, it can't, the, uh, or at least in the NFL. Mm -hmm. uh, the NFL says no. Uh, it's used for preparation. Um, so there's a feeling maybe that, that takes a little bit of the sport out of the sport, I guess. Right, and, and they're working towards it. For instance, you can have computers in the press box for statistics during the game but nothing that can be communicated down to the field. Mm -hmm. But you don't ever see a sort of two gurus at an NFL game, each with their terminal on opposite <laughs> sides of the field, you know, doing Bill Walsh. No, numbers. but oftentimes we have customers that both use our computer, that both use the game analysis modules. <laughs> so they're scouting each other on the same system. Mm -hmm. It's just the information they're putting in that's different. What about at the college level or high school level? Is Sports Bank used there? Yes, we've got uh, 19 major colleges that use our system, uh, and the majority of them are football schools doing uh, scouting reports, and high school recruiting recruiting databases, uh, injury reporting for the trainers. Yeah. Now, does your system also get used uh, besides just those tendencies you talked about in kind of in training, in nutrition, and those kinds of aspects of athletics? Sports Pack is uh, pervasive throughout the a athletic department or the sports organization. We usually break it down into three areas, uh, what we call the sports modules, the ticket modules, and the accounting modules. So the front office is using it, the ticket people are using it, uh, and the coaches, the personnel people, and the trainers all have modules. So this, this is all done on a larger computer system with a, with a telephone connection? So yeah, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a mini computer. Uh, mm -hmm. Quantel makes minis in three different sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the terminals are pulling off one terminal to 128 That's terminals. So, right. And were you using a microcomputer, Steve, when you were with the A's? We were using an Apple. And uh, Jay Alves uh, was assigned to putting that information in during the ball games and, of course, uh, adding to it from our pitching charts once the games were over. I'm just thinking also about user friendliness, and I'm, I'm imagining kind of Yogi Berra sitting down at a computer terminal. Uh, was it difficult to operate this, I mean, for an average uh, manager? Well, uh, Jay would give me the information, the uh, printout sheets uh, after the ball game, and then of course I would have plenty of time to uh, look at it, and as I said, uh, make notations on cards that I kept in my back pocket with the lineup card. 
Okay, gentlemen, thanks very much. In just a minute, we're going to take a look at how you can use computers to improve your tennis game. So stay with us. With us now is Rich Anderson. Rich has been called by some one of the most successful, or the most successful, I guess, junior college tennis coaches in the country. He also happens to be an instructor in computer science, which probably doesn't hurt. And sitting next to Rich is Bruce Brown. Bruce runs a system called CompuTennis for Stanford University's tennis team. Gary, you play much tennis? <laughs> I think uh, I've got to say my programming is a lot better than my tennis game. Okay, I'll so. play you then. <laughs> okay. uh, Rich has brought with him an interesting uh, uh, device here, a pair of devices. It's a, it's a CompuTennis CT120, which, by the way, is a, a very good application, the, the little HX20 built by Epson, a portable computer system that brings it right into the game. And this is cabled up to a compact. Rich, what is this contraption doing? Well, this is a computer age solution to a problem that we've had as tennis coaches for a long time, and that's keeping accurate data and statistics mm -hmm. in what's happening in a tennis match. Typically, what coaches do is they reach for a lunch bag, a piece of paper, and, and one of the players that's not playing to take statistics on a match. How many first serves are going in? Uh, which, which side of the uh, return is better, the forehand or the backhand? Um, and even if it's well thought out and devised in advance, it's really not accurate and you can't build the database on that so sort this, of thing. So this could be, this can be uh, right courtside and then uh, you can collect the data on this and then this is later then uploaded to the contact. Yes, the scorer carries it on, on his, his or her mm -hmm. lap. Uh, it's battery operated and every point is evaluated okay. where the serve Bruce, went. Bruce, you're actually the scorer, the guy who does this. Could you right. explain actually what you do there? Okay, what we try to do is we obviously can't score we can't enter every shot, so we try to get the key shots. We record all serves that are hit, first serve, second serve, all returns that are hit, return backhand, return forehand. And for each player on every point, we try to get up to three key shots each. So we could have a total of nine shots entered for each point. Okay, now once you get all this stuff and you have it in your compact, what do you do with it, Rich? Well, we do a variety of things. We can have an, an up-to-the-game uh, uh, analysis of what's happening in the match. We can get a much more detailed analysis after the match, have the uh, data analyzed and, and present us with reports. It's very useful in, in analyzing what one of our players is doing, somebody that we're coaching, or scouting an opponent. Okay, now this can be done during the game itself, then, with, sure. with the, uh, the CT120. Yes, it can. Okay, now you have a Davis Cup match in there. Could you show us how you'd pull something out of there and use it to, to analyze a player? Sure. This is a Davis Cup match between John McEnroe of the United States and Henrik Sundström of Sweden in the Davis Cup championship round. Um, Let's pull out... Um, so you would pull out one of these things that Bruce has been measuring, like what? Yes. I just chose here um, complete match uh, first service points one. And a player uh, like John McEnroe, who lives and dies with his serve, uh, it turns out in this match had a bad serving day and lost the match to Henrik Sundström, which um, by all tennis analysts is a, is a big, big upset. And the statistic we see uh, right away is uh, the percentage of points won, which is far below his average. So you could go back in there after a game and kind of figure out what a player like McEnroe did wrong and say, uh, John, here's where you were weak, work on this, or whatever, if you would dare say that to John. Bruce, McEnroe. if you were, uh, let's say, using the CT120 there at courtside, how, what would you tell a player? I mean, how, how, what would the analysis be? Well, a lot of times the coach about? will call up during the match and as for these statistics, we can recall them right up to the last point played and say, mm -hmm. hey, is the opponent you know, making more errors off the forehand or backhand? Which side should he serve to? Is he being more effective going up to net? And I can actually tell him right then during the match so he can help the player during the match as well as looking at him after the match and analyzing it then. Just in case the, if the opponent had a, an off day, for example, and he was missing one particular stroke. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Then he can know to attack that more. Right. Okay, well, tennis is a pretty competitive sport, but so is sailing. And, of course, one of the fiercest parts of the competition of sailing is the design of the equipment itself. And that sounds like perfect territory for a computer. Wendy Woods has a report. Ah, the open sea, the fresh air, the computers. Yes, even out here where civilization seems long gone, computers aren't. Their handiwork can be found in the sails of sailboats. Sailmakers used to employ just their brains, a good eye, and a pair of scissors. But today, sails are made for the most part by computer systems like this one. This Berkeley, California-based North Sales outlet, one of dozens of franchises all over the world, employs an MS-DOS computer to do the normally time-consuming job of number crunching in designing the perfect sail for each boat. 
A second computer receives the information and then communicates it to an industrial XY plotter. It then marks and cuts the plastic sales apart. It's easy to get hung up in the numbers of making sales, and if you can deal with the broad concepts and let the computer itself do the number crunching, it's a lot easier, and you can deal with the important things. Things like determining the stretch, shape, and strength of the sales are still left to the human experts. Plus, people still have to sew the sale together. However, the computer does reduce the labor cost and the tedium, which should also eventually reduce prices to those of us who buy this product. Of course, the success of these sales can only be judged in the sailing. And in that department, North Sales have already won many of their owners some very prestigious awards, like last year's America's Cup. Reporting for the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. I don't know how to connect up all these different topics except to say we just learned about computers and boats and now we're going to move to computers and boots. <laughs> well, not too bad. Okay. I would like to introduce Jeff Cullen and Rick Bunch. Jeff and Rick work with a biomechanics lab for Converse Incorporated and Converse, of course, makes athletic shoes, as you said. Uh, Rick, I'd like to begin with you and tell me, first of all, what does a biomechanics lab do? Okay, we're a general sports research facility supporting product development of those athletic shoes at Converse. What we're interested in is how an athlete's foot interfaces with the, the product, the footwear. So we're interested in how the shoe can affect athletic performance. Okay, now how do we use computer technology to figure that out? Like, what's that gadget you have in front of you? Okay, this is an instrument that will be interfaced to a computer to allow us to collect data on how the pressure distribution evolves beneath the heel in the shoe. So we can, we are planning to put this in the heel of a shoe and measure discreetly the loads at each of these elements. There are 24 on this small prototype and we have a larger 128 element prototype that we'll be looking at some output, some pressure output from. Rick, would this be uh, something that eventually would make it into a, a store so you could find the right kind of shoe based on, on, on your foot? It could very be mm -hmm. easily be used as a shoe selection device to mm -hmm. help uh, custom tune, if you will, how much cushioning in the rear part mm -hmm. or fore part of a shoe a particular athlete needs. We could take our, our traveling demo a show on the road, go into, a, say, a retailer, and then the consumer could try on the different pieces of shoes and see how uh, they affect his or her pressure patterns. Now you have a, a computer system here hooked up, obviously, to do some of this analysis. Mm -hmm. and, uh, where would we start taking a demo of that? Yeah, oh. Jeff, show us, show us what we would get from the, from the input that the heel would, would get sure. landing on that. This is a, we'll bring up a picture of the mat, the 128 element mat, but not the 24 element mat. This picture was developed in our lab. It is a, a subject walking across, so we only see the heel contact of the element mat. Okay, so this is going to be a representation of what happens when somebody's heel hits the ground and how the pressure forces uh, hit that. That's correct. Okay, and we're waiting, the computer's kind of putting together that... Crunching the numbers right now. Right. complicated uh, picture right now. This person would be walking from left to right on this screen, so you're seeing a very early time slice, if you will, of when the person's heel comes in contact with the ground. The toes are still in the air. Okay, and the plot's starting up now. So the toes would actually be right. under this flat surface now. They're okay. hovering above. So that above. surface hasn't been touched yet. That's, That's correct. We just have that easy. That's correct. Now, would you be uh, customizing shoes for this particular individual whose who's graph we'll see? In this case, we could very easily do that since we uh, we have a stable of elite runners throughout the United States that we do custom build shoes for. For the product development stages, what we would do is take data on uh, quite a quantity of athletes and try to get average profiles to uh, build production levels of cushioning into different models of shoes. So okay. we have kind of more uh, cushioning in one than another if it's appropriate. And Rick, this, uh, in this graph now, the hills represent uh, I guess the higher pressure areas. And right. The displacement from the surface of the grid represents how much force is applied, and every intersection is a, is a load sensor. So the load on each element is the displacement away from that grid surface. Okay, now you have another device you can use here in which you study what you call pronation. And maybe, Jeff, you could get that rolling while Rick sure can tell us what pronation is. Mm -hmm. Along with cushioning in the shoe, another very important uh, functional parameter is what's called rear foot control. And rear foot control injuries are the number one injury in running. And they accumulate over the, say, the thousands of miles that an athlete would put in uh, in training for our event, rather than the dramatic type injury, such as an ankle sprain in basketball or a single uh, event like that. They okay. are accumulated with time. Explain what you're doing here. Right now, the computer is sampling at a 30 hertz frame rate a picture of a runner running on a, on a treadmill. The computer is sampling the picture and is saved into memory. 
which allows us now to manipulate a cursor to manipulate it over the dots and determine the included angle in the shoe. So you're rolling a piece of video of a person running on a treadmill right. and then analyzing pronation. Right. This is a single frame that's been stored in commu computer memory from that one, uh, that segment, animated segment of video. Okay, and what are we going to get from that digitization then, Jeff? We move it and we find the dots with a little cursor. After we do that, the program ends and now some more number crunching goes on. What we're interested in is if you think of the, the line segments that are formed by the two dots you saw on the lower leg and the two dots on the heel, we're in it, interested in how that angle intersects. Um, problem runners who experience very excessive amounts of rear foot control may have angles up to 17 to 20 degrees. That would be excessive. And they would have to look for a shoe that has a maximum level of support. A normal range of motion may be more like 7 to 9 degrees. So we'll see what this athlete uh, where they fall within that range. Okay, and Jeff, what are we seeing now? This is a graphic illustration of what that runner had. In his particular case, he had a pronation angle of 12.3 degrees, okay. which is a little bit excessive. And that was the angle again between what and what? Bet the angle between, his, between here and here, pronation angle. What we may prescribe for that particular patient or our subject is a shoe that has maybe a moderate level of support. So we have high cushioning shoes, moderate support shoes, and maximum support shoes. Now this is a technique that you've been using on a regular basis now. It's actually in a practice. Yes. Morning. The uh, standard technique of measuring this is with 16 millimeter film and mm -hmm. it's a very tedious labor uh, intensive uh, method to get the data out. We've come on the using computer and video technique to help us speed along things so we can give on-site results back mm -hmm. to an athlete which they find very helpful. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. There are some people who think that computers don't really belong in sports, that it's kind of dehumanizing, and our commentator, Paul Schindler, is one of those people. Boy, I never even saw the ball. Well, that's how it is when you get into sports with computers. Now, I'm sure a lot of you already know that both the Miami Dolphins and the San Francisco 49ers used computers to help them get ready for the Super Bowl. And Peter Uberoth, the Olympic czar, could teach us all a few things about the use of computers in both sports organization and training. I wonder what he's got in store for professional baseball. Anyway, we all know the role of computers in sports does not yet include participation. But that's not what worries me. I just want to sound a somewhat Luddite note of caution. We need to be careful that human beings do not become computer-driven animals. Computers tell us what to do entirely too much of the time. Sports are supposed to be a refuge from that kind of daily reality. Now, I know sports haven't been pure since the Chicago Black Sox through the 1906 World Series. It isn't even called the toy department of the newspaper anymore. But let's take a stand right here. Computers out of sports. Athletics for the people. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, a high school student in California has become the first person to be charged with computer trespass under California's new computer theft law. The teenager tried to break into a Stanford University computer which stored the grades for his high school. The student gained access to part of the password by rummaging through teachers' desks. His plan was to charge his classmates $100 to change their grades. The hacker was caught when the Stanford computer alerted police to nearly 500 attempts to sign on with the wrong password. IBM says it will not only have a one megabit memory chip to compete with the expected one meg chips from Japan, but Big Blue says its monster memory chip will be twice as fast. IBM reported this week a second generation megabit RAM chip that can run at 70 nanoseconds. After weeks of rumors, Digital Equipment Corporation has confirmed that it is ending production of the Rainbow Personal Computer, essentially admitting defeat in its effort to move from the mini world into the micro world. However, DEC spokesman said the war is not over and that DEC engineers are now working on a new personal computer called the Microvax 2. Another failed computer hits the auction block next month. Convergent Technologies announced that it will be auctioning off about 6,000 WorkSlate portable computers. The WorkSlates were introduced at about $1,200. They're expected to go at auction for less than $200. Paul is back now with this week's software review. Sorry, I was just trying to figure out when to schedule more software reviews. You know, if you're busy like me, 
Every form of time management is to be treasured and you need all the help you can get. Well, there's a new form of help available called Executime. Now, sure, you've heard it all before. Calendar programs are a dime a dozen. Well, not exactly a dime, but cheap and dirty and not too functional. But Executime is different. I'd buy it just because it can handle multiple calendars in the same program. In these days of shared secretaries, wouldn't you like to have a program that one secretary could use to schedule three people? Now, let's have a look at the screen here. In seconds, you can get a quick snapshot of your time commitment for an entire week. Since a personal computer won't fit in your pocket, you can print this out. Executime also handles dateless items on your to-do list and even sorts them in priority order. Now, Executime is not overwhelmingly wonderful. It's just good software that does the job for $50 from Advanced Productivity Software in Fullerton, California. For Random Access, I'm Paul Schindler. Not enough desk space to shove your mouse around on? No problem. A company called Versatron is coming out with something called the Foot Mouse, a mouse you operate on the floor with your feet. It's reportedly easy to use and saves you the hassle of having to move your hands up and back from the mouse to the keyboard. Another new product for the Macintosh is FileVision. It is essentially a visual database program that lets you store and retrieve information by referencing pictures rather than words or numbers. Potential users could be designers, architects, or engineers. FileVision is not a full-fledged CAD system. If you think answering machines are kind of primitive and you would like to invest about a thousand bucks in your IBM PC, you might be interested in a new IBM add-on called Watson. It's a combination hardware-software package that turns your PC into a sophisticated answering machine using digitized speech. Basically, the PC can be programmed to contain a number of separate messages for a variety of potential callers. The callers each have assigned to them a unique code number, and by punching in the code number on a touchtone phone, they can summon up a particular message left just for them. The Watson device also stores phone messages from callers on disk in digitized form. Watch out for a new beauty computer called Elizabeth from cosmetic maker Elizabeth Arden. This computer captures a still frame photo of a woman, it analyzes the skin tones, then allows the operator to apply various cosmetics to the subject's face electronically with a kind of paint box. Once the subject likes the way she looks on the CRT, she hits enter and out pops a printout with all the makeup she should buy. Finally, I don't know whether it's the airline business which is bad or the computer business which is bad, but Computerland stores are advertising a free round trip on Eastern Airlines if you buy a computer system from Computerland. It sure beats Flight Simulator. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles was brought to you in part by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Popular Computing, the magazine that gives readers an understanding of the technology and applications of microcomputers and software in office, home, and classroom.